doing his eyes. And then when he sees me go to sleep again, I want him then to do a blocking technique of some kind. Yeah? So shut your eyes. Good, right. You see that? That's how I want you to practice this. Because I'll tell you now, what's going to happen in real life is that's what's going to happen. I'm going to be like this. Here you go, man. Have a listen. Remember? No preempt, was it? Huh? So, this time, the guy shuts his eyes. You'll stab him. As soon as he gets stabbed, you'll open his eyes up. Then you'll come forward for the second one, and then you'll try to do a block or grab whatever you want to do. Yeah? Let's try it, please. Shut your eyes. Then he gets stabbed. Just poke him quickly. Poke him, but I'll tell you, the second one, I mean, you really want to jump in there. Yeah? Make sure you put your hand across his chest or whatever. Make it as real. Grab his shirt. Grab his head. I don't care. Do it. Shut your eyes. Shut your eyes. And at your own time, stab when you're ready. Good evening and welcome to the FMA Discussion. This is episode 295, and tonight we have Dean Lawler on, and I'm just waiting for him to come in. He was in, so I'm just seeing what's going on. I'm going to send him a quick message. Um, hopefully there's nothing going on, on his end as far as internet. We'll soon find out. Mm, sorry, <laughs> yeah, I know. <clears throat> A video or something. Uh, to do. Okay, saw my message, so that's a good sign. At any rate. What can I talk about in the meantime? Mario, the Cyan, Screamer coming up. I believe Tom is doing that, I think, tomorrow night, actually. Tomorrow night and Saturday morning in the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken. And then Sunday, I'm going to try to have uh, Guru Jeffrey Finder on Kabbalas. I think I'm trying to shoot that for uh, Sunday night. Uh, hopefully, it all goes well. But let me just see... Uh, What's going on with, um, he was just here before, uh, we went live, of course. Hey, Big John, can you get back in? Let's see what's going on. Um, must be something, it's got to be something on his end. Can you get back in? All right, seeing my messages, so hopefully he can get in. Um, so hope, hope, hope. He's got to be trying to get back in. I'm just not sure. Okay, send me a message now. You're on a good roll there as far as tech problems. <laughs> Go figure. Mm, all right, let's see what he says. Uh, try to link again and no luck. Just stays there thinking. All right, let me send him a new link. All right, all right. Bear with us. Create new link. Okay. All right. Um, all 
All right, just send a new link. So just hang tight, folks. Apologies. What else can I talk about? Oh, uh, look out for upcoming seminars, actually. Um, <clears throat> you'll be trying to do some with uh, Tim Hartman, um, Ty Potton, Michael May Williams. Actually, I think there's going to be one at their place in Massachusetts, I'm thinking. I'm not sure uh, when it's going to be, but I think summertime is when I'm being told. So it should be uh, pretty neat. It says the link has this bar. Oh, my Lord. That was a new link. Um, what is going on? Oh, great new link. Yes. Okay. Copy. Let's try this. Oh, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, Tom's going up there. That's right. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, when that happens, uh, John, I was hoping, I wanted to show some of the knife grappling, so I was hoping you could make it. Uh, but I sh hopefully I'm going to find out soon. All right, here he is. All right. <laughs> We're back. You are back. So, all right. Hey, better late than never. So, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> don't know what happened. Dude. Like I was doing the intro, and I looked. I looked below, and I'm like, "Where'd he go?" <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. It just, uh, just uh, cut out all together, and then I tried to get back on. It just didn't work. So, yeah, and then, uh, but no worries. Hey, we're here. Okay, so um, all right, so we're gonna get jump. We're gonna jump into it. So before we get into all the good stuff, security stuff, you know, mm -hmm. your the violence trend, what you watch for, what you look for, you know, as yep. far as your staff and all that, which I can't wait to get into, to be honest with you. But you know, what was your beginning? Um, what was your initial martial arts background? Initially, um, uh, probably uh, a little bit of judo, amateur boxing. Mm. Um, did a little bit of wrestling, which wasn't overly popular here uh, in this country because uh, wrestling doesn't have a big uh, uh, school presence like you guys have over there oh no so, like in high schools and what have yeah, you? High school, yeah we don't have it yeah. we don't have wrestling and then that type yeah. of stuff you know um but uh, a little bit of that um got into a little bit of taekwondo and karate and a bit of kung fu and a bit of anything and everything um yeah uh, -huh. uh was one of those kids i suppose that uh was always questioning things mm. you know and um you know i'd question the taekwondo instructor when you'd you know you'd throw a hook punch or something because I was, I was boxing at the time and uh you'd throw a hook punch and he goes no mate there's no there's no power in that uh, you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got to put the hip into it i went okay no worries so th there was a lot of questioning and i think um in a, and it was the 80s you know it was the mid 70s yeah. early 80s um you know everyone's hero was uh, bruce lee uh, mine was it mine was it was uh, David Carradine. I thought he was the coolest oh, guy. You, oh, David Carradine for you. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was the best show ever. I, um, I couldn't comprehend Bruce Lee, but I could comprehend uh, Kwai Chang Kane for some unknown reason. You know? There you go. I always thought it was great the way this guy could walk across a burning hot desert in bare feet and uh, yeah. come to a bar, uh, ask for some water, and then beat the living hell out of everybody and just drink yeah. his tea and off he goes again. I, was, I thought that was the coolest person in the world. I was fascinated with the whole monk thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. That whole monk, you know, like I, that's what really captivated me. Like the older yeah, monks, I, 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 I thought they were like, yeah. Look, we were pretty poor kids and we came from a, a pretty poor area. So I think it was that fascination of being in a different world. And we were the TV generation, you know, like a, yeah. TV was more to us than anything. And if you didn't have any money, you had a TV. Yeah. Whether it was like a white of color. Right? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. But, uh, so you can yeah, escape. So, yeah, you got right, there. You go. You know, it's funny. I think all around our we all started out something traditional. You know what I mean? Whether it was karate, yeah. and, you know, kempo, kung fu. I mean, something traditional. You know what I mean? For me, the tur uh, the turning curve, I should say, was uh, ninety three when I saw the first UFC. I was heavily into taekwondo, and I saw that, and I'm like, so it was kind of what I was looking for without knowing. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And then through there, I actually got to really find out what I want was was of course was knife work and all that. Um, right. I was going there for MMA, but I really found out why my true love but uh so aside from that when did you what was your first dive into i guess fma or whatever um i was it's i I had the mr miyagi story happen before the karate (laughs) kid even came out i can't oh i'm looking forward to this so um, i love stories uh, yeah yeah so um my turning point was probably 1980 um, I, I, was, I was a young man. I started bouncing in pubs and uh, pubs and clubs, and I was absolutely terrified. I was uh, I, I was uh, sixty kilos, which is I don't know what that is in uh, in pounds, but uh, hmm. it's a two point two Anybody pounds to a kilo. Well, that's yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's about hundred. That's, that's about one hundred and thirty pounds, I think, right? So okay. I was only skinny and light, and I looked like. Um, um, uh, the guy from Happy Days. What was that uh, kid from Happy Days? Anyway, I look like the Karate Kid. That's pretty much what I look like. I think I was tall and skinny. And uh, yep. And uh, you know, when you first start working, you you know, the first point of call, they pick on you straight away. So, um, so my turning point was seeing so many so-called black belts and martial arts guys coming to pubs and acting like tough guys. And then getting the living hell beaten out of them by the local football player, or the yeah. local, or, uh-huh. or the or the overweight fat bouncer sitting on a stool, uh, who's been drinking half the night, takes on two or three of them and beats the living hell out of them. So I think I start. That was my sort of self realization to what was real and what wasn't real. What was mm. great in the movies and what worked in reality were a little bit different. Not saying the techniques are wrong. But I yeah. think what happened is I think there was a, a, a point there where I don't think people taught them the way they should be taught. Mm-hmm. So I think the techniques are all great. It's just the application of them and how they train them was incorrect. Yeah, the because, you know, okay. Yeah, okay. well, you remember, the, remember, they're all combat arts. And I think originally the originator was a combative person. So he yeah. was all about the combat. Yeah, that's and fair. Th- right. The original yeah. person, right? Yeah, yeah, the original person was all about the combat. Yeah. So that's that was my interest, was the original person. You know, the, I wasn't interested in who was teaching it now. I was interested about who the original person was and where did he come up with all these ideas and what were mm. the experiences that gave him all these ideas. Right, right. Um, but my uh, Filipino martial arts background, well, I ran into a guy called Maximilian de Kudes. Now, Max was from Mindanao. And he, and that's how when I started learning the knife, and that was probably 1980. Um, I accidentally ran into him through an incident that occurred outside a pub, and uh, and learnt a, a few different things off him. And he was a, he was a pretty wild guy. I wouldn't say he was a nice person. I would say that he was a, a, a very dangerous person. But he but he but I learnt a lot of stuff. And the knife work wasn't like what you see now, where people are facing each other and sparring or whatever. It was like you know, how to pull a knife on someone, how to cut someone, how to... So not like so much of a sparring, dueling lens. Uh, uh, I would probably say on the level of criminality would probably the way, criminal, to, look at, uh, the okay, way to look at this, right. yeah. Okay. Um, my second experience was that a friend of mine that was driving through Brisbane and saw an old grey-headed guy in the backyard of his place hitting tyres and hitting a tree with a stick. And he told me about him. So I went round to visit this old guy and it just happened to be a guy by the name of Carlos Navarro. Carlos and, Navarro, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so Carlos Navarro was originally from Black Eagle, and okay. uh, the Grand Master of Black Eagle, or whatever they whatever they call themselves. And um, I started sort of sparked up a friendship and started training with Carlos. It was quite funny. I trained with Carlos for a, quite a few years until I suddenly found out that he was actually the guy that actually challenged Kakoi Kenyeti in their last real fight in the Cebu Coliseum back in the eighties. How interesting. So, it is, yeah, it is. It's, it's like I said, the Mr. Miyagi moment. Suddenly I've run into this guy who's in Brisbane yeah. who actually fought Kakoi Kinyeti uh, to, to a duel, you know, and, yeah. um, and and that's pretty much how it started. So the common, and then I met Kakoi, and then Kakoi stayed at my house and, and, and so on. So um, I was very fortunate to run into those three gentlemen and learned mm. uh, so many things. Um, I probably learned more off them talking with them than I did by training with them. 
because the, the way they think, the way they worked out situations and how they responded to their environment was more interesting and probably more enlightening than the actual technique because, you know, yeah, yeah. techniques across the board are all basically the same, okay. you know, and sometimes it's just the application or the mindset of them that changes the way the technique mm. is, the, the benefits of the technique, yeah. So far as, but, you know, far as, I understand the guy from in and now and gave you more of the knife stuff and all that, but yeah. far as Carlos and GM Kakoi, you were, I mean, I, I got to assume you, you were probably getting more, like, more stick care curriculum based. Yeah, right? it was. And it was really, you know, there were a few other people involved in, in between that and so on, you know, different people and, uh, you know, people that uh, uh, had done other different systems. Um, but the knife was always the thing that interested me the most. Yeah, same. Yeah. Uh, That's not going to there. Yeah, you know I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the stick didn't do a lot for me. For the main reason is that the sticks were very, very light. And the only sticks I'd ever seen used in a street fight were fence palings or, or baseball bats or cricket bats <laughs> or whatever they grab yeah. the back of their ute or the back of their car and hit you with. So um, this light rattan stick didn't make a lot of sense to me. And, and forgive me if I upset anyone out there that loves to use this little light rattan stick, but um, the fact is that you can see two guys sparring with a light rattan stick and they will get injured but it's not the same as something with a heavy weight to it, like an iron bar and so on. So a lot of the blocks, parries and moves you do with a light rattan stick won't function against something that's a lot heavier. No, no, good point, good point. Yeah, Yeah, you know, I'm I'm with you. Like, it's almost like if you're deep in FMA world, and it's not that I don't have an appreciation for a stick like that, but it's almost, and forgive me, FMA community, but it's almost like the obligatory weapon that you have to, like you have to do it. You know what I mean? Whether you want to or whether it really resonates with you or speaks to you, but it was always edge weapons for me. I, I did the stick more or less because well, how do you how do you not? If you're not <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. which is why I really enjoyed a muck under Tomsa, because it was like, all right, all knife. Great. Yeah. Sign me up. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, the, the knife to me made a lot of sense. Um it, yeah. at, at, you know, it, it and now unfortunately in this country it's becoming the weapon of choice with a lot of young people. Um, uh, and a lot of incidents. England, here, yeah, well, as, as as Ray Floro would have told you, I suppose in New South Wales alone, you know, there's a lot of stabbings, and Victoria's the same. We're we're getting the same up here now as well. It's becoming right. the weapon of choice, which is a shame. It's um, it, it's quite sad to see that you know it's 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 turned into that sort of foray of of uh, taking it one step further uh, to what it was, and also the gun culture is starting to creep in here over as well now with. Uh, just with guns. ethics and morals with these young, I, I, you know, I hate to yeah. say it, and I'm not saying everybody in this younger generation, but I've definitely seen a decline, you know, and, and I'm not speaking just for states. It sounds like it's, you know, pretty prevalent all over. Just decline and just morals and values. Are you, now, is this, do you think there's any correlation to the gun? Like, if you guys are, you know, guns and all that. Do you think there's a correlation there? Yeah. No, look, this is how I look at it. As I mentioned when we did our test um, yesterday, I see trends happening uh, with my business the way it is, the way it's structured. I've been in the game since, like I'm 60 now, so I've been in the game since I was 18 um, it, within the security game, you know, and, and, and I'm talking pubs and clubs. I'm not talking about any other type of security, like looking after a warehouse mm. or anything. But so I've seen the, the trend change and I've seen when kickboxing was popular. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll start again. Um, when... Karate and Kung Fu was popular in the 80s mm. where everyone wanted to do it. That's all everyone ever did. You know, two guys would jump outside the nightclub and you'd see mm-hmm. Praying Mantis ah. versus Wing Chun, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, you'd see Shotokan Karate versus, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Shaolin uh, something. You know what I mean? I mean, it was like, it was, it was, it was, it was insane. It was hilarious, but hilarious, you know. Yeah. But I'll tell you a story, I had two guys one time we threw out and they said, that's it, mate, we're going to wait for you. We're going to get you when we close at three in the morning. We said, yeah, mate, no worries. And, they went outside and they did a multiple uh, sets of push-ups, sit-ups, uh, uh, dual stretching, uh, uh, one man and two man sets of kung fu moves. And then when the uh, event was over, we came outside. They ran like hell and took off and never fought anyone. But um, uh, it was that type of scene. It was it was mm. it was pretty amazing. When kickboxing became popular, suddenly everyone was a kickboxer. So you'd start seeing mm. leg kicks and you know, flying kicks and spinning kicks and things that you'd never yeah. see. Oh, what is going on here? Um, when UFC became popular, mm-hmm. that was it. 
then all of a sudden we started seeing ground and pound. Ground and pound. Yeah, and people picking yeah. people up and tackling people yeah, down. Yeah, and throwing them down. And, yeah. You know, it was all kind of, it was crazy. So do I see a correlation when it comes to guns and knives? And look, I'm going to be a little bit outrageous here, I suppose, to some people. Um, I believe that anything where you're continually involved with or exposed to in an environment, it has to affect you. So if you're, and I don't want to upset all the video game people, but if you're playing games that are violent with knives, sticks, guns, you name it, all the, over and over and over again, and it's that violent world where you're seeing it all the time on TV, mm. you're seeing it in the game, I think it does have to affect you in some way or another. Mm. Does it make you um, a little bit uh, immune to the threat, think, thinking that, you know, you'll be able to do it and survive. And if someone tries to do it to you, you'll be able to survive the gunshot or the stab wound. I think maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. But I have seen that. And um, I've seen group oh. attacks improve. And I've seen the demographic of people change where it's no longer the big, you know, it was always the big badass guy that wanted to fight everyone was the guy you always worried about in the pub. Now you've got to worry about the 18-year-old little blonde girl who might just turn around and glass the girl next to her or pull her hair and smack her in the head with a bottle or, you know, yeah. th that's the type of thing we're seeing at this present time. It's the demographic now has become so widespread. You can't judge it anymore. You know, you can't say mm. it's the, the tough guy anymore. Now it's the middle-aged woman or it's the husband and wife team punching yeah. on with the other husband and wife team. It's, uh, it's really crazy. It, it, it's, it has changed. Yeah. The reason I'm asking is, like I look at England, for instance, London, you see this, you know, this heavily increase in knife attacks because obviously they can't have guns there. And I was just wondering if there were some parallel, you know, same, it is. similar situation. It is. It is. I think you'll find, yeah, I think you'll find in places like Scotland, Ireland, England, Australia, New Zealand, places like that type of background, Canada, I suppose, in some ways, mm -hmm. where guns aren't overly prevalent. I think mm -hmm. you do find there's a lot more assaults, a lot more physical attacks, a lot more bludgeoning with weapons. A lot more uh, edge weapon attacks, of course, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I do believe that. 100%. Yeah, yeah. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence. And we got folks jumping here to say hello. And I just want to make sure I'm not ignoring them. We have Eric O'Brien, John Guzman, Zima, Conrad, Indra. We got George Harrison, Tim Hardman. All right, folks, yes, if you're watching, tell us who you're watching from. Smash that like button. Um, so how did you get, okay, so you mentioned security. So I know you started out in pubs yep. and, and all that, yep. but where did, so um, what made you interested in security and where did, it, where did it go from just bouncing at bars? As in the as training? In like, or... as like, like where you, it sounds like you definitely have gone from the bar scene into more of a, the corporate world, I'm guessing? Yeah, we, we have to a point. We have to a point. Um, mm. uh, I think there's a gradual progression to it. One thing I noticed is a lot of people that were working, to explain, to, to, to digress a little bit, um, um, in the early days of security, anyone really could be the bouncer. I don't know what it's like in America, but over here, anyone could be it. And so a lot of guys that were doing the job had you know done a bit of time some of them some of them mm. been there done that you know the local local lads as they call them and um and and the great thing about those guys and working with those guys as a young as a young man was they had this insight this ability to see other bad people to mm. see traits they would cause so you learnt a lot from those type of guys when okay. licensing came into this country it stopped a lot of those guys from working because they had previous charges and, 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 oh, and dubious okay. backgrounds. So you end up having an influx of, of trained killers come into the industry, you know, kickboxers, martial arts people and so on. Mm -hmm. So even then I started seeing a change. We started seeing a lot more choking, a lot more kicks to the head, a lot more martial art techniques for bouncers using against patrons. And I started okay. noticing that trend and, and, and we weren't really into that type of scene. So what we were trying to do is that when I first started this, the, the, the business, I would get all my guys together and we'd train together and learn how to do control and restraint, how to work group tactics. No different than a military scene where we'd go, look, two guys go here, one guy goes there. Mm. You know, we don't triangulate because triangulate makes people aggressive. 
you know, we follow the straight line motion. We do a whole lot of different things like that. And we just got a reputation out there where the guys knew how to do their job without actually having to cross that line. So, and that's no offense to anyone else in the bouncing scene because there's some yeah, yeah, great yeah, yeah. guys out there that did fantastic jobs. But that's when I noticed, and I noticed that people were looking more for that customer service a- a- attitude of the guy, the guy that could walk the talk, talk the, you know, mm. walk the walk, talk the talk, and, and so on, and be pleasant and, and without having to be the, the so called tough guy. Um, but I'm starting to see that change a bit again now. Um, that worked for a lot of years. Now a lot of people say, well, now we want a guy that can really handle himself. You know, these little guys that come out there and, and, and they're really nice to everyone. The customer service is great, but we want a bit of presence now because the violence has escalated a little bit. Uh, right. So it's really funny. It's, it's sort of up and down, like in waves. Up and down, pending the, I guess, the yeah. climate and what they're currently training or doing. Yeah. So how did you, um, so it sounds like, so when did you, I guess, start your own firm? I mean, how did this come about from being um, a bouncer? I got a bit of a, um, <laughs> I'll tell you the story, but it's, I'm not trying to put any parallels to me, to Patrick Swayze, okay? I just want to make <laughs> hey, it clear to everybody, right? <laughs> right? I, I know I look something like him, but no, no, I don't, I don't, right? I look more like his sister, I think, but, um, uh, uh, but, but the fact is, um, uh, I, I got a bit of a reputation with a group of guys with me as well that we could do the job um, mm. and people liked that. Um, when I used to meet people, I, used to say, Look, I always thought you'd be bigger. It was that type of thing that came from the movie, you know, the Roadhouse oh. movie, which we always found yeah. quite hilarious. But the fact is we got a reputation and we could go around and we would get offered jobs to fix up places. In other words, make straighten the place out, clean the place up, and that's how it started. Then people started offering me bars and pubs they go look mate you do a great job here i've got three bars would you like to take them over and that's pretty much how the business started ah no kidding so you just yeah. create really more bouncing jobs yeah. as a whole. yeah okay all right and then they started offering and said well why don't you get a, your team together and we'll and take over this area and that's pretty much how it started and don't get me wrong i'm not a tough guy far from it i don't profess to be one i don't profess to be a great fighter uh, but i do profess to be a, a smart man and i do mm. profess to have good strategy when it comes to uh, business and when it comes to uh, uh, defense. Uh, so yeah, that's the yeah. mentality I like to do. You know, I, I think um, the, the tough guy thing just doesn't work. Not 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 within the corporate world, that's for sure. No, within the, no yeah, because they'll just go look to hire somebody else maybe if, they, if they're yeah, turned exactly, off by yeah. you. I mean, yeah. 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 So, uh, so it sounds like it went from like you kind of getting multiple bar accounts to when did it segue into, I guess, other accounts or bigger oh, accounts? pretty much almost straight away like when it did start it exploded you know wow. and to end up having you know 20 30 40 50 60 70 80 you know and uh, it, it turned into a, a pretty big business um at the moment now i've probably spent the last few years as i'm getting a bit older of course i've, I've sort of got rid of a few calmed it down and made it a a comfortable business to run rather than because i'll tell you at one time there like it, it was it was stressful I mean, it was like, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, one incident yeah, after another. Well, you know, anything to do yeah. with alcohol and nightclubs and so on, you know, you're dealing with personalities. You're not dealing with sane people. Yeah, you're dealing with personalities. yeah that's got to yeah. be yeah. tough too, man. Wow. And, yeah, um, well, you know. So are you still, did it still kind of stay at the bar entertainment level? Or yeah, did you yeah get we're still in that companies? area because, you know, if you're good at something, why run away from it? I mean, you know, we are that's good true, at That's true, right. Uh, we just at the moment now we got we have the ability, thank God, that we that we have the opportunity to pick and choose who we wish to work with. You're right, and right. Uh, that's that's a big advantage. Whereas before we would take on work because we you just need just to have it. Now, yeah, that's it. Now we wow. sort of go, look, yes, no, yes, no. You know. So how does okay? So when far as training your guys, like. Mm-hmm. As far as the martial arts concerned, I mean, is there a plethora you're giving them? FMA, little this, little that. As far as the training, Look, I, I I try to get people to. Um, I'm very big on acclimation training, acclimatizing mm-hmm. people to the the game, as I call it. Um, as I said before, I think techniques are all the same, and I see so many different uh, masters and experts around the world, and they pretty much in the end end up talking the same language 
you know, same techniques. And then they try to outdo each other by saying one's a little bit more competent than the other, or one's a bit more experienced, or, you know, uh, this guy's this and this guy's that. I, I try to go on results more than anything. And, and, and I class myself as being a little bit of a, a, a martial scientist, I suppose, in some ways. Um, I test things. And I like to test mm. things, but I test things maybe a little bit more violently than others. And and the main reason why is probably because of the crew that I, I started off with. Um, these were pretty hardened mm. guys, so they could handle a little bit of pressure every now and then. Um, and so our training developed into that. Now, sometimes when I do seminars, I, 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 I must admit I frighten the living hell out of some people. I upset a lot of people, uh, especially within the martial arts game, because martial arts people don't like to be told they're not doing the right thing, because as far as they're concerned, yeah, they all are doing yeah, it. Yeah. Um, uh, I've had people blame me for losing students because I proved that something they did was wrong. It, yeah, it, it, it becomes yeah. pretty crazy. There, there are some strange guys. Martial arts is great. Like I'm not a martial arts guy. I don't class myself as one. Um, yeah. I don't have a lot of martial art friends and the ones I do have, I'm very selective. I can't deal with a lot of them because a lot of them are very insecure individuals, which fascinates no, you're, you're me. Out of me because, yeah, yeah. 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 But it fascinates the hell out of me because that's what it's supposed to be fixing. I, it's I, supposed to make you a better person. Yeah, yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. It's crazy. It, you know, it's but then again, it's a hospitality, right? Mm. I'm in the hospitality business. And I'd say when I say I'm inhospitality, I would say definitely because it's inhospitable. I mean, the people are terrible. <laughs> hospitality people are, are the most. Yeah, oh my god! And yeah, for me, it's it's a tough community. I don't know how much you know. You know, it is. It's, a lot of it's. There's some really good folks in there. There really, really are. But there's yeah. some you can see it, and because I run the group there, and uh, you see you see the insecurities and the egos, and some of them. Yeah. Like if. Uh, and it gets into, particularly if you're pointing out or questioning something, like you might not be criticizing it, you might be critiquing it, asking a question, but it doesn't come across that way to many, and they just get really, you know, kind of defensive and up. So yeah, I get your yeah insecurity. Yeah, um, I like I, I like to I like people to show me things, mm. you know, and 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 the the thing, it, it, you know, it, it amazes me. We're going in this full circle again. We were full of these magicians and charlatans back in the 70s and 80s with all this magic stuff they had out there. You know, the death yeah. touches. And forgive me to the dim muck people. Please, I don't want any abusive messages, please. And you know, I, want, I, want my, I want my cat to live a bit longer and my dog to live a bit longer. So if you do death touch me and my cat dies three days later, please don't do you're that. You're going to come home tomorrow when you're going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So... Um, um, look, and some of the and some of the guys that do the mm. the, the the nerve pinches and the and 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 those sort of things, absolutely fantastic. And they, I'm absolutely in awe of them because some of them are great at it, and some of them are just bloody magicians. Um, mm. I think I think the thing that concerns me the most uh, is that we're doing that cyclic behaviour again. We had the charlatans in the seventies and eighties, then we had this realism kick in where we've got you know the UFC comes in and all this kickboxing mm. and everyone starts getting real. And now we're starting to get it again now. We're starting to get these people that come out now and I'm going to show you how to you know, hit a lot harder than everyone else and, and I'm going to show you how to do this and block this because I'm a former Navy SEAL come commando and I'm an ex-police officer and I'm this and that. And I'll go, that's great. That's really cool. But my concern about it is that a lot of these things, and, and, so, and forgive me all you people if you, get, if you suddenly decide to hate me for this, but um, I think... Um, Everything is always done from a point of balance. Mm. They don't ever seem to do anything where their their balance is offset, where they're in a state of imbalance. Everything is like they're standing there, the guy stabs the knife, they block it, they do this, they do that. But I never see anything. I don't see any real drilling of it. I don't see them put in the situations where they can't respond in a balance. Anything works if you're balanced. So I can throw the most powerful punch in the world at your head, Dean, and it could, you know, go through your head and pull the brain out the back, right? But the fact is, is that can I do that whilst while you are threatening me? Can yeah. I do that while I'm I'm being attacked? Right. A totally different thing altogether. And that's the that's my interest. My interest is what can we do while we're under that threat? That's why you see these fantastic, okay. yeah. It's like when you see these fantastic boxers, right? And I'm a I'm an ex boxer. I love boxing, you know, kickboxing and all that stuff. 
we see these fantastic boxes and you might see like Canelo fighting someone and he, you know, ducks, he weaves and so on and he gets away from you think, you know, that's an amazing skill to do while under pressure someone's trying to actually knock you out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and things happen. But if you saw his last fight a little bit, you'd see that, that Bivol was a, big, a bigger man and he's putting a bit more heavier pressure on him. Suddenly the ducking and weaving and slipping wasn't as sharp as it normally is. Mm. And that's my fascination to it. Like my fascination is you should be training for that moment, not training for the perfect moment. That's why I don't yeah. like a lot of knife defense or, or weapons work because it always ends on a positive. I mean, a hundred percent. You block the knife, man. Yeah, yeah, you block the knife, hundred percent. Yeah, you know, do that's this. Truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I started um, developing drills that put people in terrible positions. Okay. So, so I don't believe you should ever practice too much of 100% of blocking the knife. My belief, I think you should always practice a lot of times of what to do after you've been stabbed, mm. not before you've been stabbed. Because if I want to stab you, I'm certainly not going to jump out and go, ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to stab you. And yeah. um, so we started developing drills like that within our knife uh, arena where we would practice being stabbed first and then responding to the stab. You know what? And mm -hmm. I think it's time to pull your video. <laughs> oh yeah. Don't, yeah. Okay. Forgive me of any comments on there that I've upset. No, you. no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Um, you know what's so funny? Yeah, I saw your the one I referenced, the one that's a longer version here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do that one. I saw that like five years ago, and I and I didn't at the time. I didn't know who you were, mm -hmm. but I'm like, this guy knows what's going on. I'm like, it might be a little with a you know with a profanity and all that, but what this guy's talking about is truth. And um, and you had that poor guy against the wall and then. <laughs> just and, he, and, and don't be wrong, he's a great guy. But the fact is, the yeah. point, before you put the video, the point I want to put across to people, and this is where people lose the point of the video. The point of the video is, as I mentioned before, everyone does everything from a balanced position. Right. They right. practice these techniques, and they practice with a padded floor and a fluorescent lights above them, and mm -hmm. little rubber blades, and so on. My thing was always about what if some guy just gets in your face, calls you every now and then in the sun absolutely mm. terrifies the living hell out of you and then he just gives it to you what do you do okay. and it's amazing that i, I look at and, and, and no offense to people and I, and I can't i keep saying that but i, I upset so many people it's okay don't worry. um but um it's amazing how so many well-known and experienced guys i've done that same thing to and they've all failed I'm um, not yeah i don't I think would have, pressure tests yeah. a lot yeah, yeah, I would probably get maybe one out of 10 that responded mm. in kind. And I went, wow, that's great. And the others just stood back and went, whoa. And they said, oh, hang on, can I do that again? And I went, too late, you're dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and it's not a, and, and it's not, and, and, and a lot of some people thought it was cruel and terrible, but it was, I was just trying to express a point. The point was that it's never going to be what you think it is. No, no, and I... And I think that's what I greatly appreciate when I first saw your video some five years ago around that time. I'm like, you know, and I knew it. I go, people are going to get stuck on what he's, how he's saying it, as opposed yeah. to what his message is. And I totally got it. And I, and I, I thought it was really good. As a matter of fact, I remember posting in a small, this is, this is before FMA discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a smaller group and I posted, I, I remember that, but the folks, um, I'm going to be showing, I'm going to be pulling up a video now that's not as long as the one that we're talking about now. However, though, thank God. This, yeah, <laughs> but this is definitely going to parallel to what um, Dean, uh, Dean is saying far as um, not, well, whether you're not training in a comfort zone or the, I'm going to let him articulate it, but here we go. So folks, check this out. Um, I got to re-pull it up. This got stale. Um, but in the meantime, uh, but you guys are going to really um, just bear with me. I'm going to have to pull it again from here. But you guys are really going to really enjoy this. Um, I did at least anyhow. And it's pretty realistic training. Um, 
in my book. And when it comes to and forgive, knife, and for, and forgive the fashion sense. Yeah, I think we need more of this. Um, to be quite honest with you. Um, so yeah, without further ado, here we go. And it's coming up now. Mm. All right. I'm going to lower myself so that it'll make a bigger screen. If someone said to me, could we verbally de-escalate a situation when someone is sincerely intent on doing damage to me? And the answer is, <coughs> no. yeah, sweet, effort, no. Because for me to be able to de-escalate an attack, I have to have a relationship with this guy of some kind. <coughs> Hopefully not a sexual one. <laughs> so, so the main reason why, and we have to have connection. In other words, we can either have a connection as like the master-servant relationship, like I own a shop, you've bought a product, you're not happy with the product, you bring it back, we have an argument and I de-escalate the situation, in the end we come to some agreement. But there has to be a connection. You know, um, you can't verbally de-escalate a situation if someone is intent on doing you harm. Because, especially if it's someone you've never known. Those three videos basically were people that didn't really know anyone. The last one with the gang, that's a different. There's a personal connection there. Those first three, there's no connection. None. There's no way in a million years could you verbally de-escalate that. Even if you had the opportunity to see the knife first and say something, it wasn't going to happen. What I'm going to do now is, as soon as I stab him, I want him to open his eyes. And then when he sees me go to stab him again, I want him then to do a blocking technique of some kind. Yeah? So shut your eyes. Good, right. You see that? That's how I want you to practice this. Because I'll tell you now, what's going to happen in real life is that's what's going to happen. I'm going to be like this. Here you go, man. Have this in. Here. Remember? No preempt, was it? Huh? So this time, the guy shuts his eyes. You'll stab him. As soon as he gets stabbed, you'll open his eyes up. Then you'll come forward for the second one. And then you'll try to do a block or grab whatever you want to do. Yeah? Let's try it, please. Shut your eyes. You're going to get stabbed? Just poke him, quickly. Poke him, but I'll tell you, the second one, I mean, you really want to jump in there. Yeah? Make sure you put your hand across his chest or whatever, make it as real, grab his shirt, grab his head, I don't care, do it. Shut your eyes. Shut your eyes. And at your own time, stab when you're ready. Um, right, so I'm going to let you speak on that, but the one, a couple things that really stood out, I really enjoyed, um, not just the exercise, but what you were talking about, that relationship piece, I, I found, I, I really found that profound and something mm -hmm. I never really heard before. So before we get into the training, can you speak on that more? Well... <laughs> Any assault that I've ever seen, if it's a personal assault where someone knows each other, or you've got the opportunity to talk to the attacker first, you're creating a relationship. Mm -hmm. But there's been so many stabbings, and I think the great, the, a great example of that is if you look at some YouTube clips of some of the stabbings you see in the UK, where some young man, some poor young fella, uh, died from a single stab wound. He was just sitting on a bench and these group of guys walked out, and the guy just stabbed him, went bang, 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 stabbed him two or three times for no other reason but to take his phone. That's it, gone. There was no time to see anything, no mm -hmm. time to respond to anything, and there was no relationship created. And so many people work off the idea today. Like, I see a lot of people teaching reality-based stuff, you know, and they stand there and they scream and shout at each other, and, ah, oh, you're a, you know, I don't like your haircut, yeah. Your sister's ugly, you know, hey, oh, I'm so upset by it all. But the fact is that none of that stuff works. I mean, because I know you, now we've only just met each other. If we started doing that drill, you're not going to take it seriously because we know each other. Because we know, each, I, yeah. yeah, we know each other. Point. Right, yeah, right, you know, right. so, so my belief is you need to practice things that where there is no relationship. The beauty of shutting your eyes in that stab action is there's no connection between you and me. Mm. When my eyes are open and your eyes are open, there's a connection. I know you're going to do this. 
I can see it coming. You know you're going to do it. And we've both agreed that this is what's going to happen. When my eyes are shut and you suddenly go, boom, and stab me, and I go, oh, God, that hurt. And then you just stab me again, again, again. Now there is no relationship. Now I've got to respond to something that's come left field that I was not expecting, even though I knew you were going to do it to me. It's a really tenuous grip to it. And that's where people fall down. You know, they all, everyone I speak, oh, guy pulls a knife, just run away. Well, it's great yeah, if you can run away. If you can't run, run, you got loved ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and I always said, everyone, think about this. If you're going to fight a guy, no matter what it is, if your ego is that, that fragile that you have to punch on with everyone you meet, think of your wife, your girlfriend, your children that are with you at the time. That's what Which I mean. way do you go? Look, if you really are a tough guy, then you know what you do? You go, no worries, mate. Yep, you're the tough guy. I'm out of here. See you later. You might cop a smack in the mouth. If you really want to do something, take your wife and your children back to the car. Tell them to start the car up. Go back over there and beat the hell out of the guy. If yeah. you're really that need of power and try to be the tough guy, then go do it. If not, just go away. Just walk away from it. Absolutely. Because you've got to... Especially with loved ones. Kids? Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. But if you're by yourself and you want to prove that you're the man, well, Mate, you know, go go for your life. I don't care what you do, but you know, yeah, that's what yeah. you want to do. You want to be a tough guy. But so many tough guys get killed. That's what I always say. And it's and it's normally not. He's never been a tough guy. He's just a guy who thought he was a tough guy. Yeah. Um, my dad had a saying one time when a group of guys asked him one time. Um, you know, my dad's name was Dick, um, and they said, uh, "What's it? What's it like to be a hard man? You know, I like to be a hard man, a mole man. You know what a hard man is? A hard man is a good man because it's so hard to be a good man." And I think that's really what it's all about. It's so hard mm. to be the good man, you know, to mm. leave your ego at the door, to be able to walk away and keep your life intact. I mean, get home. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, so the, that, that connection that we get with our attacker um, is, is so tenuous at the best of times. And it fascinates me when we sort of believe in the attacker, you know, do this and I won't hurt you. Do this and I won't stab you. Do this and I won't shoot you. Mm-hmm. Those type of things fascinate the living hell out of me. You don't even know this guy and you believe in everything he tells you. I, I, I just, so, I'm going to start uh, when I, you know, because I always kind of do some background research. And when I saw that video, I'm, oh my God, it's the same guy I saw five years ago. And then I, of course, <laughs> found there, I, I first, then I found the yeah. original one, which yeah. I am going to, I am going to paste a link here. When we're done this yeah. interview, I, I want folks yeah, to see the that. short one. The short one, please. The short one. I get in too much trouble. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, I, I don't. I do. I do not have a filter at the best. When it comes to teaching yeah. stuff, I don't. I don't have a filter, and I think you should not have a filter when it comes to teaching. I definitely reality. felt the dynamic. Like yeah. I was not even the setting and I'm like watching it and I like, I felt it from watching it. And well, I think... I'll give you an example, right? In that yeah. one, in, in, we do that with a knife and, and we can either use rolled up newspaper. I don't believe in using rubber knives. Yeah, I use yeah, a wood yeah. knife that has a point to it or I use rolled up newspaper that's taped up with tape. And so you can actually feel impact whether it's to mm. the face or to the chest or to the body, but you can feel impact. You need to feel the impact. The, yeah. the beauty of my friend Tony Blower, how he created that high gear, um, people were under the illusion that it was this protective suit of armour where you could just beat the living hell each other and not feel anything. That's not what you want. That's why I don't like the Filipino headgear with the head stick fighting because it gives the illusion that you can wear 50 yeah. inches of the head with a stick. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I had a, a, a martial artist, and I, I won't say his name, but he was pretty well known. Um, he said, oh, you know, that, that rattan stick, I mean, what would you do to me if I just came and crash tackled you to the ground? I said, I'd hit you. And he goes, oh, yeah. So he come in and I sort of half hit him and then he crash tackled me to the ground. And I said, but, you know, in reality, I'd be really trying to hit you. He goes, yeah, but, you know, I reckon I could wear it. And I said, okay. So he come in and I used the butt of the stick and hit him right in the back of the skull and suddenly the story changed because it really, really hurt. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm a great believer in that. I, I, love, I love the dog brothers when they're sparring. I think I like yeah. that. But at the same time too, um, I'd like to see the dog brothers use a big heavy stick and do that type of sparring. And if you notice when they do do that sparring, you notice that you don't see any of the, 
the parry and catch. You don't see any of these. Yeah, you're not putting your hand. Yeah, you're not putting your hand in. Uh, no, and what does it become? It becomes fencing yeah. with a stick. Yeah, longer range. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're not crashing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't like the the grappling part to it when they get in there. I, I, I do it's too. Real. Yeah, it's real. I don't be yeah. wrong, but I don't know if that would be we would want to be grappling if you were getting hit with a big heavy baton. Um, yeah, if it was really yeah, heavy, the pull, you know, you're like an underhook or overhook, and the guy's just yeah. slamming you with it. Yeah, yeah I mean, that could yeah. be, yeah, that yeah. could be problem. And don't get me wrong, the light with tan stick can be an amazing thing. I got into a situation once outside a house, and um, I actually pulled a, a, a whippy little branch off a tree out there and used that like a whip. Yeah. And what I did is, as the guy went to move forward, I just snapped the backhand and whipped him in the eyes with it and split him open. And it worked. Yes. Like, I didn't have to batten him. So yeah. you know, do you understand? It's, so I think in situations like that, the weapon sort of denotes the time, the space, what is the right motion to use at the time. Mm. But, but as far as you mentioned before, the relationship, I just don't like the idea of this building relationship with the bad guy. I think it's wrong. I think you need to, you need to be as cold-hearted as what he is to defend yourself. Um, and so when people are training, you need to be the bad guy. So... I'll give you another example of a drill we did. Um, I'm starting to look like one of those Kung Fu movies where I'm moving really fast, my mouth is in, out of sync. But um, uh, we, I had a guy, I had a, a group of police officers training with me and we had them practicing being stabbed and we did the drill against the wall and everything else. So as a trial, I decided to do something a little bit different because some of the guys were, were really handling the stress. They were getting used to it. Then I started getting them to shut their eyes, be about a meter, you know, two or three feet away from the wall, feet together, and we were slamming them into the wall. And then once we slammed the wall, then we'd attack them. So it was the added bonus of the impact of the wall, eyes shut, eyes open, mm. being attacked and responding. And that added another level to, to the drill. And then you started seeing a few cracks in the armor. Some people weren't handling it as good as the first motion they were doing especially the martial arts guys. The guys were so used to be standing in one spot and responding oh. to an attack. Suddenly, in, in, in a kinetic sense, they were finding it very difficult and, um, and so on. But then I took it one step further. Without telling them, I told them to shut their eyes and I actually got someone to kneel down like the old schoolboy trick on all fours behind them. And then when they shoved them this time, they fell over the back of that person and hit the deck real hard on the ground against the wall. And then the guy attacked them and stabbed them. And then that hit another level. And then suddenly it was like, whoa. And then so in the end, out of, say, 15 people, we had maybe three at the end that showed that they could handle that level of stress all the way through. Mm. And the others, and it just gradually dropped down each time that drill got a little bit more difficult. Wow. Yeah. It, I tell you, though, what I'd like, too, is, I mean, the, the introduction of stress inoculation you're doing there, I mean, too, uh, to me, like if you don't match, like you, you made a good point about you got to match the intensity. If you don't match the you intensity, like how, what do you, how do you think you're going to stop this person? <laughs> I mean, well, it, it's the intent. And I think that's yeah. one thing you learn. Intent is everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have that intent. If you're going to stab someone, when I stab you um, in, in a drill, I'm really the bad guy. I mean, I take on the guys of the bad guy. I really want to stab you. And then when I want to yeah. punch you, I'm really going to punch you. And I think that's how you got to be. The, the concern I have when I see people practicing with uh, rubber sticks and, and, uh, and, and light sticks and so on, they never really hit the person because there's always that fear of hurting someone. So if you and I were practicing the stick, what I would do is I'd roll up some newspapers and I would tape them up with a bit of gaffer tape or electrical tape. And mm -hmm. I would have that. Or I would use like a pool noodle. You know, do you have pool noodles? You know, yeah, those long yeah, things put in yeah. the pool? Or I'd get one of those and cut it in half and make it into a stick, yeah? And what I do is I tell people now to swing that at the person's head as hard and as fast as they can. And surprisingly enough, people will do it because they know it's not going to hurt the person. Mm. And now it becomes real. Now you're getting a real swing at you with real speed, real timing. Whereas before, people don't swing it real. 
I mean, they don't even attempt it because they're still that that sense of I don't really want to hurt the guy. Right. Now they can go real power, real. Yeah. 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 So yeah. if you and I were training, I'd put you against Paul, and you're an experienced guy. What I would do, I'd say, okay, you're pretty experienced. I'm not going to hit you in the head, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this big rolled up newspaper. And I'm going to hit you on the side of the shoulder with it. And you're going to go, oh, that stings. I said, great, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to shut your eyes and stand there with your hands down. And I'm going to swing this as hard as I bloody can. I'm going to hit you right across your shoulder, across your chest here. And it's going to sting like hell. And then as I hit you once, I'm going to pull my hand back immediately and hit you a second time. What I want you to do is intervene between that first and second hit. And the second in between. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And guess what happens? You should see the timing change. When people practicing with a, a real stick and they're trying with their eyes open, people some people are perfect at it. They go, ah, and they go, yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. wow, that's great. When they shut their eyes and, and they actually feel the impact and they go, oh, my God, that really hurt, there's that hesitation and the timing is completely off. The mm. more they practice with it, the better they become. And what happens is then in the end they get what they call realistic timing, not um, set timing or make-believe timing which a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people do, thinking they're doing the right thing for training. It's not real timing. Real timing is when you're feeling the effects of the attack and your timing is responding by that. That's why football players, uh, baseball players can hit the ball way over the pitch or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what they call baseball. I don't play baseball. But they can do all these amazing things. Everyone goes, wow. But when the game comes, not too many, except for the elite ones, can pull yeah. off this same thing in the game. And during the game, yeah. That's right. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to pull off these elite moves. You know, when I see these amazing blocks and disarms of blades and retaliating with the blade, and I go, mate, I'm telling you now, when we put that pressure thing where we're really trying to stab these guys, none of those disarms work. None of those retaliating with the blade works. You know, you're jumping. Yeah, you, here's the thing, and I'm I'm with you. I, I I I'm not disagreeing at all. I mean, this is you know, I have to play kind of like in the, on the fence because of the group. I have to, you know, yeah, yeah, of administrator, but totally, I I totally agree with you. Now that well, it's going to be very hard, like peels, <laughs> stuff like that. When you're oh yeah, really <laughs> tense and just. Uh, mate, look, I, I had a very well-known martial artist friend of mine. He's a lovely man. I think you should get him on. Um, and he said to me, he goes, I would love to do what Dean Lawler does. He says, if I did that, but I wouldn't make any money if I did. Um, <laughs> because um, a lot of people love my seminars and a lot of people hate my seminars. Yeah. Very yeah, few true. like them. Um, because the worst thing in the world is to be brought to sense the truth. The truth frightens a lot of people. Not saying that I have the truth, but the truth within yourself. Truth in general. It's very, yeah. very hard to be sincerely honest to yourself yeah. and to other people because you don't want to yeah. hurt people's feelings. Yeah, right. That's not, yeah, you don't want to go there and you know, all that. But much to, like your friend said, the art sells. Come yeah. back the truth. Not yeah. so much. And look, and like I said, I don't profess to be the, the be all end all of it. And I don't expect, and I don't profess to be the tough guy either. But mm. what I am is I'm a realist and I, and I go by results. I see people improve exponentially when they train that way. And I mean exponentially to the point where I've had um, guys that are on the seminar circuit, martial arts guys, say about some of my guys saying, man, I would love to train with you guys. This, the intensity is like, wow, that's, you know, because it's, it, it's, that's the way it is. But, you know, few and far between, like, you know, I'm not going to have a class of 100 people training with me. Right. You know, right, I might right. start with 100. I think I did a seminar once down south, and I think we started off with about 60 for the first day of the seminar. The second day, I think about 10, 10 came back. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, but, but it, it, those type of things happen because it, it good on standard, frightens people. People want magic. No, want or they magic. want just easy, right? Or a lot of them just don't want to put the work in. I mean, I, I... Yeah. I don't know. They don't want to fail. Magic either. cells. They don't want to fail. They don't yeah. want to fail. Yeah, you don't want to fail. And I think that's a really sad attitude now because yeah. to me, failure is a great thing. Yeah, failure is an absolute yeah. great thing because you I, can't grow without failure, whether you like it or not. 100%. You know? 100%. But I think, I think it was Customato said that about Mike Tyson. 
and 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 if I've misquoted him, please forgive me, all you Customato fans out there. But I think he said that it would be good for Mike to lose when he was younger, so he can feel the experience of losing, so that when he is on top, when it does happen, he's going to be able to relate to it. And I think, you know, and I probably said a little bit bit better, a bit more articulate than I am, but but I think that's really the case. It's better for you to fail early. So you know whether you can step over that mark or you can get back up on that horse again. If you can't, yeah. then you can't. That's it. You know, um, it, it is good every now and then to understand that feeling. Yeah. No, I think he's. I think he had. I think he was had something going there. Um, so, so yeah. Again, you know, just back. So, yep. so really, you know, I mean, so you're pretty much doing seminars and your group training. Like you're not really. Like you don't have obviously you don't have a school you're not i have a I, I, no i have a little gym that we that we box and we kickbox and wrestle and do a bit of weapons work and so on and i oh, have okay. a and i have a resident filipino martial arts instructor there elwin gavatara who, who's a sixth degree black belt in dose Pares. he teaches a group of guys there um oh, nice. i love okay. the philippine okay. I, I love the filipino martial arts i think they're great um and i think they're i think they're great to do great to practice I just think in some way, some people don't treat it or teach it the way it should be taught. I was very fortunate that every person I trained with was very big on combat. Like Kako mm -hmm. was big on combat. He was big mm -hmm. on doing, not necessarily saying. Carlos Navarro was the same. Like, mm -hmm. poor old Carlos, lovely man, only a tiny little guy, but man, he'd fight anybody. I mean, fight, he even try to fight me all the time. It just drove me crazy. But, but, but he, was, he was great. And, uh, and Max was the same. And I, and I think to me, um, love them or hate them, I think the beauty of it is that they were combatively um, uh, minded in everything they did. And mm. I think that's how you have to be if that's the attitude you want. Me, I'm all about the combat. I'm not about anything else but that. I don't make money out of it. God, man, I'd, I'd, I'd go broke if I opened up a martial arts school. I'd go absolutely yeah. broke. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just about that combat. I, I love to see the wimp turn into war into the warrior. That's a big thing with me, you know. That where I see this guy, this frightened little guy or girl, and suddenly within, a, and I tell you, the great thing about acclimation training, if you do it correctly and you do it in a graduated form mm. or, the, or a form of gradient learning, you see in a very short period of time of anything between four and six weeks, someone go from being a wimp into a warrior. It's pretty mm. amazing. And they don't learn a lot of techniques. They just yeah, learn right. it's just half a dozen your... techniques and they're trying to kill them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, wow. No, I, I again, I, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I love what you're about. So, so when your seminars, like, so I know you, you, you know, you just mentioned you got like a little place you work out of. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you got time to time, you got guest instructors coming in and what have you. So when you go on the road to do seminars, are you pretty much just coming from a self-defense perspective then? Not so yeah, much? Not, nine mm -hmm. times out of 10. A lot of people know me as that. I mean, a lot of people okay. don't realize that, you know, I've been doing Filipino martial arts for a very, very long time. I know a, a lot of different variety of styles in them. I've trained with a lot of well-known people within the, in the game. But I try to teach... Like I said, I'm about the combat. If you want to learn the art, I'll teach you an art. But um, to me, that's not what turns me on. What gets mm. me going is that that combative aspect to it, you know. Um, and 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 I think I probably prefer the knife rather than the stick, as you yeah, mentioned earlier. Here. Like the knife, the knife yeah. fascinates me. Um, same here. Yeah. yeah, it fascinates me because it's so hard to come up with an answer. That's why it fascinates me. If you're doing it realistic, like you obviously are, and all yeah. that, and man, if you think you're tapping, and I, you, if you don't think you're gonna, you don't want to hear to two on one to stop that thing. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> oh, just, mate, I don't know. Mate, we, we, um, it's amazing how, the, like I said before about gradient learning and and testing. At the beginning, a lot of guys will get stabbed six or seven times before they actually get a response, and other until they come back and take control of the guy on the knife. Now mm -hmm. that to me in a street is, is you're dead. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, um, yeah, you're man, you're definitely yeah. dead. The more you acclimate, the the beauty of it is, in the end, you might find you get stabbed two or three times. Mm -hmm. Do you ever not get stabbed at all? Yeah, maybe once in a blue moon, but yeah. there's always you are always getting stabbed. You know, 
Um, yeah, if you're doing you know, it realistically, man, you're going to fail. There's going to be failures. 100%. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, yeah. I well, still fail. Uh, yeah. Well, I think yeah. I was probably one of the first ones that I used to actually in my class, I used to teach first aid. The first training course you ever did with me was a first aid course in knife defense was I'd show you how to plug up a wound, how to wrap, wrap a, a, a wound, how to sort it, how to treat someone, how to use, how to use the, a, a medical applications mm. to these things. Because in case you ran into someone that had been stabbed or a friend of yours got stabbed so you could save their life and also how to apply them to you if you're alone yeah, and you've yeah, been yeah. cut. So that was the first class I would do with people is that. And people would go, man, I didn't come here to learn this. I came here to learn how to, you know, defend against a knife. I said, well, that's what you teach it. That's what I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you how to survive. Uh, yeah, so you live or your friend can yeah. live. I mean, yeah. You know, little things like, you know, get your, your 911 as you have it or your triple zero, we have it on your phone so that you can call it immediately, you know, mm -hmm. have someone close by. And, you know, all those sort of things, they all count. That should be part of your knife course. Your knife course should, should be showing you how to walk down a street, how to walk past an alleyway, which direction do you look, you know, how to handle walking up to a car if someone calls you over, you know, how to approach a car, how to move away from a car, how to approach a car in a shopping centre, you know, if, you're, if you've got your groceries, you're walking up to it in case there's someone hiding near it, in it or around it that's going to come and, and attack you. Those sort of things are probably more important than the actual techniques. Than the actual defence. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. you go to the next step of learning, you know, how to, when, when can, confronted, how do you respond and what do you do? Yeah. You know, teach people how to breathe. Teach people how to breathe and get ready for the situation to occur. You know, you mm -hmm. could be in the third person situation where you and I are talking and then one of our friends uh, is getting attacked. And now we have to yeah. say, well, how do we respond now? What do we do? Do, you know, when I teach families, when I get like, I get a lot of dads and sons come in and dads and daughters and I always go, mm. well, work a strategy. If she's being attacked or dad's being attacked, what's the strategy? What would you do first? Don't run in there blindly yeah. you know, because yeah. you know, you, you'll, you'll end up being a victim as well. So what do you do? So have a strategy in place. Those things are more important. And, and, and I pretty much almost do that every class. If I teach a, a boxing technique, or a stick technique, I always show a street application of when it can occur, when it can happen, mm. and how to avoid it in that situation. Where yeah, to stand. Like yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I, I saw... Street. Yeah. And without, without being rude, I saw one of your guests on, he was talking about teaching how to, you know, I don't necessarily block uh, the strikes of the stick, but I evade it. And it fascinates me because whenever I see people evading sticks and weapons, they all seem to always go for the backhand. It's always, it's always a backhand strike they evade. I don't see a lot of people evading the forehand strike. The, the forehand, forehand strike is 99% of the time, that's what's going to happen to you. The backhand, that's the first one's coming. If they're running, yeah, I've, I've never yeah. seen a backhand swing in a street fight in my life. Initially, you know? initially. Yeah, 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 initially, yeah, you know. And, and, uh, and, the forehand, and if the guy's got a machete in his hand and he's swinging that forehand strike, then you're angling off to the side. Man, you want to be really careful with that. And because yeah. we've done it quite often where we've used uh, rolled up newspapers and whatever. And I'll tell you, you'd be quite amazed how that, that, that machete goes all the way through and cuts you on the legs and the back and all kinds oh, of things, yeah. a real situation. You know, so a lot of these so-called evasive manoeuvres that some people teach and not necessarily, look, in a tournament, yeah, maybe they work. Because you're not really killing each other, are you? But in a point mm. of where it's life or death, you know, what are you supposed to be doing? You know? Yeah, it's amazing. I think I totally agree with you. Like if, if you have a family, like, like you should definitely have a plan. Like, yeah, you know, one always. of the things I have a plan with my family is, you know, I, I have a big thing with parking garages. I just, there's just so many things that can go wrong in a parking garage. <laughs> it's just like, and, and, and don't get me wrong. They're scary as hell. I've yeah, gone to many of just, them after work. Yeah. Like I have a, yeah. like a thing with parking garages, but man, you better believe it. You're like, have a plan. You know, and I, same like you do, I, I encourage, you know, my students who have families, you know, we go over that because, man, that's, you want to start, I mean, you want to find out then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but isn't it amazing, bud? I talk to so many different people that specialize in weapons and they never ever think of doing first aid courses. That is, 
and I, I got me that's something and I got I'm guilty I have to get into that I have to do yeah. that yeah. because think about it that's that's going to be your number one comeback yeah. I mean you know you honestly think you're going to get into a knife fight and not be injured you know and you might even have the guy that attacks you you might turn it back on him and he gets injured if you're a good person, you're not, you're not even going to let the bad guy die. You're going to try to make him survive as well. Yeah, so the ambulance gets there and what have you. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So think about it. I mean, to me, I think it's a priority just to learn that, you know? Um, yeah, that's I, I a good remember, point. Yeah, I remember yeah, doing right. that even with, with empty hands, showing people how to look after someone that's been unconscious, that's been knocked mm. out, knocked on the ground, you know, because okay. part of your duty of care as a security officer or a bouncer was that that duty of care you know put them in the recovery position make sure they're breathing make sure the air no, is clear. Okay. yeah so i think i think that type of thing should be taught within the martial arts just as important as you punching and kicking yeah you're, it's the, i can tell you right now it's nowhere it's, it's not and i i agree with you it, it should be almost like part of the curriculum or syllabus per se you know? yeah 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 and i think you know and it, it'll upset a lot of people but i mean you don't have to teach a, a full intensive course to it but teach them basic things. What do I do? You know, what do I do if I'm cut That's here? Point. Like you knock somebody you out. Know? Like what, what yeah. do you do? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, and, I mean, and, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, show yeah. them how to use a, a, a tourniquet, you know, show them all these different things that have to be used. I mean, you know, be amazed how many people don't know how to do those things and watch their loved ones pass away in front of them or, the, uh, or, the, or pass away themselves. Man. Yeah. You know, oh, it, it's, it's frightening. You remember we are talking, and, that, and that's where I think the ego maniacs need to pull their heads in because we're not talking martial arts here. We're talking about life or death. So that's where I get upset when I hear some clown in his multicolored outfit with 55 badges on his legs um, turns around and starts trying to explain to me that, mate, what I'm doing is not the martial arts way. And I go, are you an idiot? You know, because yeah, that's... that type of stuff drives me crazy. Yeah, that's I just... hate it when I... Yeah, sorry. But I hate it when I see people say things like, ah, oh, that knife video, I remember one guy and he's a very well-known guy. I think you might even had him on your show. I'm not too sure. But he turned and goes, no one attacks someone who went like that in a knife fight. I'm thinking, and this guy supposedly is the expert, and I'm thinking to myself, man, what planet is this guy on? You know? It's unsophisticated. As, they need it. And yeah, the yeah, skilled it's, guy it's, who can come up with a ganyo and just... Whoo, but no, the general is going to be, they need an attachment and they're going to be ramming that thing freaking yeah. home. I just love it when I see guys saying things like, oh, just punch the knife out of his hand or, uh, or, kick or, it. or, yeah. or shoot the knife out of his hand or, uh, or, or, do, or kick the knife out of his hand. I go, look, yeah. man, I'd love to. But in practice, everything works. In your living room, in your yeah. gym, in your dojo, your queen, whatever you want to call it, everything works. Because it's the perfect situation. The perfect situation. Everything works great. It's like, you know, you plan a, a nice romantic night with your wife or whatever, and it, the, I'm going to get the flowers, they're going to show up, then the chocolates, and then we're going to go to dinner. Mate, the flowers don't show up. They go to the next door neighbour instead. The chocolates are, are, are praline, and she hates praline. But they're chocolates. melted. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you go to have dinner, and the, and, and the dinner is absolute shit. And and, uh -huh. you get, and you know and you think well that didn't work out well and then she turns to you and goes well it's a thought that counts and you even feel like even more shit now because yeah, yeah. That she doesn't mean it means this is crap you know so um so I think in in the dojo everything works fantastic but in reality mm. you have to practice for the mistake and that's wow. what I like to do I like to practice being stabbed first before practicing I do of blocking I the stab. I am good at like I I do I try to pressure test but like I'll I'll turn my back I, I try to yep. I try to get creative and all that but I gotta admit I have not tried and I do I am gonna try that I'm just gonna take one and then just react from there and, just go, you know? and I'll tell you one thing especially if you do the stick one because the thing about that is that you'll find that when you get hit with a stick and you go God that hurt and then your yeah, eyes open up and you think shit he comes to say you know the second one's coming in straight away. I tell you, your timing has to be so good. The in between, so good. Mm. Oh yeah, and you'd be amazed how many people falter. You know, they go and and then if they do do good, what I tend to do is hit them that little bit extra harder the next time I do it because then it just upsets their disrupts their timing even more. More because of the same so, distraction. Uh. Yeah, for you to be a good coach in this area, I think you have to be very much aware of what it's like to be 
in those situations. And that's the advantage, I think, in some ways mm -hmm. I had because I've been in that bouncing situation where Racing, it's all dead quiet. You know. Yeah, dead quiet. Next thing you know, someone goes, bam, or suddenly someone gets bottled or you get hit. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had guys just walk past me, next thing you know, bang, I've been hit in the back of the head because they just want to do it. Now, you know, this is, that's the reason. You know, yeah, I know. So I just, think I know. the training has to be, yeah, the training has to be very realistic, and it needs to change. You need to up it all the time. That one little level, up, 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 until the point mm -hmm. where you learn and change it. If if you're going to do it, I know you said before you, you do that where you turn your back and everything, but learn to not be up against the wall, be away from the wall slightly, mm -hmm. shut your eyes, practice the motion then. And really make sure they really lunge at you when they do it, not just yeah, yeah, stick yeah. their it's arm out. Like intent, yeah. Then the second level is then to shut your eyes and get them to shove you into the wall, then, okay. then attack you, because then it's the impact. You go, whoa, yeah. and you don't feel it. And then after that, start mixing it up. Um, we, I do what they call lineups. So imagine this. It's like we'll have 10 people up against the wall, and there'll be 10 people away from the wall that are their partners. Okay. They will do a drill, and we don't do the drill any longer than one minute. Because one thing I've found about reflexive training, anything more than one minute creates, sets in fatigue. Mental fatigue and physical fatigue really, really mm -hmm. quickly. So one minute is the limit when it comes to this type of training. So you do a one minute with about a 20 second break. And as it goes on, it becomes very laborious, but it becomes very, very stressful. So what okay. happens then is that you've got 10 guys. And say if you're number one on that list and I'm in front of you, you shut your eyes, I shove you in the wall, I attack you, and you go, and you try to defend, you go, well, then it stops. And you go, what hell? Then we do it again. Then what happens is that we rotate counterclockwise, and then you shut your eyes. Now you've got another guy in front of you, a different mm -hmm. guy altogether different timing, different size, right. different aggression. So every time you do it, it's stab, ah, back, rotate, stab, ah, ah, back, rotate. And we do that for one minute, then we have a 20 second break and then we start again. Yeah. And that's a great way of doing it. And you get, you know, if you've got five people against the wall, then you get five minutes of it. Then I, you have I, a break. I'm can't wait to try it. I'm trying it this Saturday with a couple of my guys. Uh, you know, because yeah. I always want to. You'll, like, you'll enjoy it. it. It's a lot of fun. It's frightening yeah. at the beginning, and you've got to be, and you've got to hate your, you've got to hate your mate. Yeah, yeah. And I really mean, I say that when you've got to hate your mate, you've got to be very competitive and go, man, throw the respect out the window, and just say to the guy, man, I'm just going to stab the living hell out of you. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, End of story. Yeah. And the yeah, more, I mean, and the yeah. more, I, the more I hate you. The more I'm yeah, the more you're getting. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I don't mind failing. Like, I, I'm like, I have that attitude. Like, I want to be the best version of myself. So I know that's yeah. gonna include failing. Like, I, yeah. I know that. Like, for I, because I have, I, I failed miserably. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. We, we all do, mate. You know, like, yeah. You know, I've, so, you, you, it's you know. amazing how you get in situations and and how you're blinded to situations. And you know, you do get when you're in. Uh, vicious assaults you get that mad tunnel vision that kicks in and this is another area a lot of people don't realize so the more you do that drill that rotation drill it does get you into that blind spot situation because when we go from that singular drill and we go into having two or three guys attack you it's yeah. amazing you end up get you end up getting a little bit of what i sort of call like spatial blindness you you suddenly don't seem to see the other guy on the side of you as much because you, you've, your heightened sense of awareness has worked on this tunnel vision of looking forward all the time. Now you've mm -hmm. got to start using your peripheral vision. So you have to retrain that as well. So it, it, it's, it's crazy how it works. But I'll give an example of a situation that happened with me many, many years ago. We had an absolute all-in brawl. And I had this guy over the front of a taxi cab at the front of an iClub. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm punching into this guy. And forgive, guys, forgive people out there if I'm sounding too violent, but... Unfortunately, that's the business sometimes. So I'm punching in this guy and he's trying to punch me and I've got him over the cab. But you know, you have those dreams when you can't seem to run away from someone fast enough or you or you can't yeah. jump high enough. Yeah. And, and I'm hitting that's this terrible. guy and I just can't <laughs> seem to hit this guy hard enough. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? What is, I can't hit him. Anyway, so 
And then all of a sudden, bang, I hit him and hit him. Then the second hit knocked him out. Great. And I was off onto the next character for the fight. And I thought, okay, well, do you know what happened there? Later on, I'm, later on, we're talking about the fight afterwards as the four of us sitting down saying, man, what a punch on that was. You know, and there was like 10 of them and four of us. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, but back of my head is so sore. I couldn't understand why the back of my head was sore. We looked back on the videotape of the, of the assault and I've got this guy over the bonnet of the car and I'm hitting him. And as I'm hitting him, his friend has come up behind me and grabbed my arm, my punching arm. But I'm so intent on hitting him, I don't even know he's grabbed my arm. No kidding. Yeah. So okay. he's grabbed my arm and he's punching me in the back of the head with his other arm. So that's where the big lumps come. And I didn't even feel this because I'm so intent on in, in killing this bloke. Isn't that but something? Then, then my other, other crew members come running past and gone, bam, hit this guy and dropped him. And then all of a sudden my arm's free. And then you see me hit this guy, put it, and I just walk off like it was nothing happened. But at the time, I was totally oblivious to what the hell was going on. Isn't that something? I mean, wow. That's what they call, you know, people say the heat of battle. Yeah. And that's one thing that as martial artists, we don't do a lot of. We don't do a lot of heat of battle. Yeah. And that's what the drilling has to be. You, you are drilling for the heat of battle. That's what you're doing. Wow. You're not doing it for anything else. You're not doing it for your belt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, or for your next next rank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Jeez. But I think it's yeah. I think it's um and I do recommend everybody and I know this sounds awful, but I mean I don't know awful, but I suppose a bit weird, but I do recommend everybody to do security. I mean, just do it. Just do it for a month or a couple of months, just for the just sake experience, of it. like I gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah. Look, it's easier than becoming a cop and getting shot at. But yeah. uh, but, but, but what I'm saying is just, just get used to this madness, this maniacal behavior of people when they're on, on, on drugs or they're on the alcohol, alcohol or there's domestic fights happening and mm. or people just are just antisocial. I mean, you know, yeah, um, right. I, I love that saying from Batman that a friend of mine said when um, uh, I think Alfred's talking to Bruce Wayne and he goes, Bruce Wayne says, well, you know, why do people do this? And he just goes, Bruce, some people just want to see the world burn. And I think yeah. you've got to take that with you every time you go to training. There are some people out there that really, really just want to see the world burn. Yeah, they just want to hurt you. Yeah, they just want to hurt you. Yeah. Social pass. It, yeah. yeah. Wow, we got Eric here, volunteer dean. <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks eric thanks for the vote of confidence <laughs> yeah but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of, before we go before we go there's a lot of amazing martial arts people out there this country of, of mine has a lot of amazing guys oh my god yeah um, ray floro yeah yeah you've got some great guys out there yeah that have done some amazing things yeah and i think and and, and i think it, it there's no harm in learning as much as you can even if the person only has one thing to teach you you know yeah. um sure but, but I, I, a question I always say to everyone, I say to all your listeners out there is this, is that when you do do something, when you go to a school, if it's the first time you want your family to do it or you want to train with someone, I say, ask these three questions. And it, actually six questions, but I, I call them three. Ask them, if I get into an assault, what do I say? What don't I say? Mm. What do I do? What don't I do? And when do I do it? And when don't I do it? If the guy can answer all three, then then do your training. If he can't, then don't, because that's not real. Most martial arts will tell you what to do and what not to do. Mm. Not many of them will. Some of them will think they're telling you when to do it and when not to do it. But not many tell you what to say and what not to say. And and that's right. always been a thing with me. So when I talk to other martial arts masters, I suppose, if you want to call them for want of a better term, um, because I certainly don't class myself as one of them. Um, I ask them those questions. So if you're in a situation, what would you say? What wouldn't you say? You know, what would you do? What wouldn't you do? And so when do I do this? You've got to understand is that you're in it. How long have you been doing martial arts for, Dean? So, uh, it was teens and college. It was internet. So from like late 90s to now, it's been my most. Yeah. So about 150 now. years. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so the reason why I say that when you when when you when you're dealing with martial arts instructors is that asking those questions is so important because 
not everyone is experienced like you. Like some people are terrified, terrified of their own shadow. So if they get grabbed by someone, they want to know, when do I gouge his eye out? When do I right. kick him in the groin? When do I side kick his knee? When do I do all these wonderful things? When? Mm -hmm. And then they say, but I don't feel like I can do it. It's scaring the hell out of me. Yeah. You know, what do I say so, when the police come? Or what don't I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mate, more I don't so feel well. Can I, I need a rest. I, no more questions yeah. until you take me. <laughs> well, I actually, get, I actually get our solicitor or lawyer, as you call them over there, to come into my security guys training once a month. And each That's month I have, a, I have a different guest. And I, oh, have a, and I have the lawyer come in and say, and tell them how to write a report, how to respond to the police, mm. how to say what happened, because it's very easy to uh, make yourself look guilty. And yeah, uh, I mean, you when you've done the right thing. Right. Yeah. And you know the law the way the law is, you know, it's whoever tells the best story. Yeah, you know, right. You know, yeah. uh, you know, so it's, it's, it, it is, it is, it is oh, scary. Speak of the devil. Uh, Maestro Ray, Maestro Ray. <laughs> he just yeah, jumped in. Exactly. Ray Floral. Like I said, like, like Ray's stuff is great because, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's realistic. It's broken down to the point where you can utilize it. I mean, that's, yeah. I think anything that can be utilized as functional is great. You know, yeah. um, mates of mine like Tony Blower, like, man, I love Tony Blower. Tony Blower. Oh, I had him on. Oh, I'm a huge fan of yeah. Tony Blower. Huge well, Tony, Tony and I have been friends for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and when I when I met Tony was because of the interest and the same interest in thinking like, you know, he, he's a little bit older than I am. I think mm. he's about 30 or 40 years older than me, actually. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's pushing. Yeah, pushing. 90, yeah, he's pushed, you know? yeah, he's pushing about 97 <laughs> or something. Right. But 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 the, the the attraction between him and I was the fact is that what he was doing over there, I was doing over here in, in, in Australia. Yeah, you guys are definitely similar mindsets. I had them yeah. on, for sure. Yeah, and I, could, and, I could, and I could see the parallels. So, and we hit it off. You know, look, some people don't like him. Yeah. yeah, some people don't like him. Uh, look, it's uh, I'm a huge Pete's fan of his. Huge, yeah. huge fan of his. And you know, the huge. thing about it is that what he's done, he's packaged something together so well yeah. and created an experience for people. I mean, that's where people go on. People say, oh, he's really, really great. He, and he makes a great package and he does this and that. But mm -hmm. no, what he's done is he's, the, his key, and forgive me, Tony, if, I'm, if you don't like what I'm saying, but them's the breaks, brother. But, but, but he's created an experience for people. I mean, that's really where it's at. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the experience. Your students want to come and train with you because they want to learn how to handle the experience of an assault or the yeah. experience of the art or the experience mm -hmm. of that particular wrestling maneuver or whatever. So uh, I think I'm a great, um, and I've done this with quite a few different podcasts and so on, but if I ask you a question, what's one thing in swimming that can't be taught? Eh? One thing in swimming that cannot be can't, taught. That cannot be taught. Drowning. No. Um... No. No, I can teach drowning. It's quite easy. I can show you. Um, I should have been called rock because I definitely swim like one. Yeah. One thing that you, can't be taught. Yeah. You can't teach buoyancy. You can't teach floating. Buoyancy. You, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. You can tell people how to do it, but you can't you can teach it. Okay. Right. Because the only way you acquire it by feeling it. And the funny okay. thing about it is that once you learned how to float, you notice that you never forgot how to do it. Sure, so okay. if I give you an easier question, what's one thing in riding a bike that can't be taught? That can't be taught. Yeah. You got to balance. You got to feel the balance. That's it. Same balance. Thing. Yeah. But right. once you ride a bike once, yeah. that's what happens. True. hundred mm -hmm. years later, you can never be in a bike. Yeah, right. You can still jump on it, even though if you're decrepit and broken that's down. Right. <laughs> that's right. So basically what I'm saying here, this key is an aesthetic way of training and behavior is more important than the technique most of the times. Mm. So my training is based on that. I give you the experience of what it's all about. Then you never forget how to utilize that technique. See, you'll always remember that forearm block if you'd done it under such pressure that it worked, it worked, it worked. Yeah, that's you'll gonna resonate never forget with you. it. You'll never yeah. forget it. Yeah. Now, I don't know about what your background is, but I don't know if you have you ever knocked anyone out and in boxing they said they saw yeah. stars. They okay. Never... So yeah. okay, so this is how it works, right? 
And what did you knock him out with? Which hand? Uh, right. Okay, right hand. When you are under undue pressure and the fight comes down, I guarantee you anything, you'll start throwing that right hand again. You know why? Yeah. You've had success with it. Oh, yeah, it's my bread and butter. Oh, yeah, yeah. I totally agree you with understand? you on that. That thing and is that's going. What, <laughs> and, why, and why is that? Because you did it while under pressure yeah. and it was real and it was a keys and aesthetic sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how your training has to be. If you yeah. want that particular block, move, swing, stab, strike, whatever the work, then you need to train under that because that way then you will never forget it. And if you're a taekwondo guy and you had great success with a front kick, I guarantee you, the shit, the shit hits the fan, you're going to throw a front kick. It might not be the right thing to throw, but you'll throw it. But you're going to throw it though. Uh, yeah. yeah, because you All had right. success with it. That's yeah? wow. Good man, this is great stuff. Great stuff. So you, people don't people don't ever understand that. I mean, it's I've seen um, I've seen guys do all these wonderful martial art techniques, and then I've seen them get under pressure and hit someone with a big swinging right hand, and I go, "What happened to the kung fu move, mate?" Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Where did, laughs> kung fu where, went out uh, the window. The big swinging right hand. Pray, where, it where, where, where happened to the pre mantis? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's and, well, and that's no offense to the kung fu guys. Yeah? Oh, I know, like absolutely. Not. I think yeah. it's fantastic. You know, yeah. I'll tell you a story. My, my brothers and I did a stupid thing. My, we, one time we were trying to get the tattoos that Kwai Chan Kane had on his forearms. Oh, and we yeah. Got a tin and, we, and we cut out with tin strips on the side these things that look like a dragon, a tiger. Probably would look more like a mushroom and an ant, I think. But, but And then we stood, put all the wood inside and heat it up. And we we're thinking we could probably grab that, lift it up, and get these wonderful oh my God. burnt on tattoos. <laughs> Thank yeah. God we got found out and it never happened. Otherwise, mate, we'd, I'd have this terrible scar of a frog uh, on one side and a mushroom on the other. But um, uh, I think um, really when you're training, that's what it is. That key synthetic behavior is so important when it comes yeah. to your training. That's a success. This, man, yeah. this is great stuff. It's so true. Like you associate by association, like you said, yeah. you know, with the of swimming, like, okay buoyancy yeah. the bike balance yeah. like like you don't forget that you're gonna do that so you're naturally yeah. and it's, one thing that right it, it just well if you've ever ridden, 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 a, ridden a horse is the same if you ever ridden yeah. a horse once you ride a horse once you know the right horse you never forget how to ride a horse you never forget the what side to get on him to get off you don't forget how to control it because everything is done through feeling the, the, people can tell you how to hang on to something but mm. people never but people can't give you the experience that's why your True. drills have to be as real as possible. You know, I, I saw, a, okay. I saw a, uh, a video on, on YouTube with, um, who's that SEAL team guy that, um, that catches all the fake SEALs out there? Uh, what's his name? I can't remember oh, his name. I don't know. But, yeah, anyway, Anybody his here? son, his son is a SEAL team guy and they interviewed him. Huh. And um, say again, sorry. No, I'm just thinking anybody watching, maybe they yeah, they may know. Mention on there, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his son makes an amazing thing when he says that when they were in war over, in, I think it was Afghanistan or Iraq, wherever it was, he talks about how they were under heavy fire, and and people were sitting back going, "Wow, what's going on here?" And but he says, but if it wasn't for the training they had done, if their training had been so realistic. A lot of them would not have survived the situation. Yeah, the old yeah. guys that they trained with that had been there, done that, told them, yeah, this is what they tell you to do, but this is what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. And because this is how it's going to feel and this is what's going to happen. And I think it was, it was a very eye-opening, uh, um, mind-opening uh, interview to watch. And, and I love seeing things like that because what it does, it, it, it um, validates what I've been trying to put across to people. Yeah, to yeah, point yeah. Where, your training has to be so close to being real without being injurious. And, and, and you've got to get that effect. You've got to have, walk away and go, that was great. That's why I said one minute. Don't do any more than a minute. Because anything more yeah, than you minute, said, like exhaustion. Too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, I hate doing that. You know, when you see these people do these silly things, and I mm -hmm. see so many people doing it. And, and, and sorry, I'm going to upset all the crap my guy guys, but I see them doing it as well. You know, they do these things where they, you know, do 50 push-ups and 5,000 sit-ups and they run 26 miles and then they uh, then they say, now get attacked and it teaches you to fight back. Well, mate, I can't see the sense behind that because 
if I did that and I'm in the gym and, and I'm feeling really tired, I'd go, Dean, kill me. I don't care because I'll have a rest after I just give up. It, yes, it's not real. Rest after, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm have a real. cocktail in you when I get home. So just, yeah, you know, yeah. Do, 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 do. yeah, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not real, you know, and I, and I, and yeah. I, and look, and I know they say it teaches heart and it shows that I can continue on and whatever, and it teaches that indomitable spirit. Yeah, maybe it does. I don't know. But I find that short, fast, violent actions create instant responses, real responses. And you know yourself, um, if you want to know, and forgive me if people think I'm being sexist here, but if you want to know whether you've got yourself a good woman, you know that in times of trouble, the one that sticks by you to the end doesn't judge you and works with you, you mm. know she's the one you're going to be with for the rest of your life. Yeah, 100%. And I've seen so many marriages fail where people go, everything's going great, great marriage. 20 years later, suddenly things turn bad, and then bang, they're gone. It's divorced yeah. on. No money, mm. no this, bit of trouble, off they go. Yeah, they just they couldn't stick it out. or, and yeah. or, or yeah, yeah. Well, martial arts is the same. It's no different. It's that test. Yeah. Oh, I like the parallel. Yeah. Yeah. You never ever see the real person until they're put under pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Until they're, oh, yeah. Oh, I like you that. never I like see that. the real person. Yeah. You know, never. Until, you just yeah. won't see them. Yeah. I'd love to get all these gurus out there, all these, you know, trained killers that are teaching all this wonderful stuff. I'd love to be able to do like a, some type of reality program, you know, and I think we'd make a lot of money. So if there's any producers out there who want to spend the money, call me. Um, where we get them all together and we put them under all these mad uh, acclimation training drills that we do yeah. and see who comes out on top. <laughs> that would be, yeah, I tell you, I bet you there'd be some surprises. I yeah, you, there would be. And I bet you the biggest, biggest of names, are, are, yeah. I know just from, and again, I know we don't take this the wrong way, just from interviewing a lot on here, a lot of the big names are failing. Yeah, yeah, and the reason why is because in that moment of truth, you see the real person, the real yeah. person, yeah. you know. And and I tell you, man, it's frightening. I tell you, I've had big, strong guys work with me, and I've seen them never falter. Take on ten guys, great, and then one little incident. Like we had a a, a a death on site, which is terrible. God bless the poor person, but they um with that death on site and i saw this guy and we and it was still violent the situation was still occurring the guys on the ground were trying to revive him and i saw one guy completely turn to water a guy who i'd relied upon for many years super tough guy and i saw him completely fall apart because he'd met his limit you know everyone mm -hmm. has that particular limit that breaking point and his mm -hmm. point was that and then i've seen others where who i thought would break and in that situation, rose to the occasion. Rose out, rose up. Yeah. You know? And I mean, that's the beauty of when you are training that way. You might find the softest, weakest, skinniest guy or girl in your class, and you think, this guy's hopeless. And then you'll do those draws with him, and you'll suddenly go, and man, this he comes alive. Sure. And just, yeah. He just never got the opportunity to, yeah. you know. <laughs> and then you see the big, fit young guy that you, that you think is the just star of your class. Breaks and off. You see him, yeah. And you see him falter. Yeah. Right? And I mean, that's the beauty of it. It does test to where you where your level is. And I mean, that's mm. to me where it's all at. I love the idea of that. Like, I'm getting a bit old now for it. But, you know, but the fact is, like, if I could keep doing this till I was 100, I'd love to do it. Because I think testing yourself every day is great. Oh, I, I can't wait. Like, I, I, I just, I just, again, I love that, like, to the brink of, you know, where you fail, but then you try to reduce the, I mean, you know, just, you yeah. know, just. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to trying this Saturday. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm getting on that wall. I'm shutting my eyes. And boom. <laughs> Just expect some shock and awe. <laughs> no, I do. Yeah, we do a lot of wall training, too, because, now, so yeah. What what it does, it does create a, a very uh, a lot of camaraderie when you do train like that. It's like the the yeah, old brothers. Right, arms you're putting yourself you know? like to freaking hell. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, and everyone sort of does the old back slap afterwards and. Give each other a hug and go, man, that was mad. You know, let's do it again. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, man. Well, this is this has been awesome. I'm so glad. I'm actually, I gotta thank Mark Stewart because he's the one that recommended you. So, mate, uh, I love that guy. And look, mate, he I really is, do. man. That guy is something else, huh? 
<laughs> mate, mate he's, a, he's a character. But I'll tell you one thing. He's very articulate. Yeah. What he does with the JKD and that I absolutely love because yeah, I think he shows, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think he shows a true side to it. No, because whenever yeah. I used to he look does. at JKD, so. yeah, JKD to me always looked like kickboxing, you know. Yeah, and then yeah. when I see him do it, I suddenly go, wow, that that does look like Bruce Lee, you know. There's yeah, yeah. the movements, the way they are, and so I think he sort of shows and look and like I said, I'm going to play upset of the J JKD community now, but. But that, uh, it's it's sort of like I see a real JKD there, you know. No. I'm not saying that he's the real, but I see a style. Do you know, if for want of a better word? No, I totally I agree with you. Like yeah. a lot of the conceptual, and nothing against the conceptual on coming under the Anasano under, you know, yep. under there. And that's where I came from. Um, but he definitely like being under directly under Ten Long. I mean, you definitely yep. see a difference, you know. Yeah, I he, recommend people to train with Mark for the main reason is that they will learn, they will see a different side of the JKD, which I think is something that we should all have a look at and I realize know. the brilliance of what Bruce Lee was. Like, yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm not, and, and I was never a fan of him. And, you know, I was never a fan of That's Bruce right, you were, you were David. Uh, <laughs> David Carradine. I just hope to God I never end up in a closet somewhere. But anyway, but, 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 um, uh, but, but yeah, I was never a fan of Bruce Lee, but I, I, what I what Mark showed me, I saw a brilliance there, and I thought it was absolutely. And I think it's very underestimated what a lot of what Bruce Lee has done actually to to the world of martial arts. So there you go. You know. Yeah, I what agree. I know no, he's. But getting back, you I, should get him back on again. He's a, he's a, he's a character. I love him for for him being a character. He, he, the guy's just he's a he's funny. Yeah, he's just he's. Funny. Mate, I tell you, he's very he's very knowledgeable, bud. His oh, no, martial 100%. arts is great as well. And I yeah. love the direct correlation they do with the JKD and the Filipino martial arts as well. I think it adds yeah. another dimension to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, one thing I've got to say about Filipino martial sure. arts too before we go is I really dislike when I see people showing the empty hand version of Filipino martial arts. You know, they go mm -hmm. from this, this swing and stick around. Yeah. <laughs> And then they show these really twisty little roly poly, flowery mm. little moves with their hands, and I sort of say to myself, "Well, how does that directly relate to the stick? It, it, it doesn't make any sense to me." So, to me, Sinawali is the empty hands of Filipino martial arts. Mm. So, your the stick is in your hand. When you take the stick out of your hand, then your elbow becomes your hand. And the forearm, mm -hmm. forearm, and the, hand, the fist becomes the forearm stick. hacks. Whatever yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. So then yeah. I think Sinawali to me is the empty hand version. That's my that's my opinion. And the more that I've trained with guys that were very combative, the more I saw that occurring. I didn't mm -hmm. see the little flowery, and and yeah, you know, and being a boxer like yourself and so on, I wouldn't want to do these little pass and flowery motions against a good boxer. I mean, you know, I did it to a Filipino martial arts quite a few years ago. And uh, he said he could do these moves and block my jab and cross and knight him with a jab and a cross and knocked him fair square out cold. Yeah, I can tell you, I, I tried that stuff and I first was exposed to the Anasano blend empty hand yeah. stuff. Yep. Your Pan Tukin, your Pan Jockman. And I was yep. trying to do uh, the goon things, all that against yep. a Golden Gloves guy. Freaking man, I got freaking creamed. Like that, yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that, 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 the only that, thing that worked was this. Yeah, that that gunting, yeah, that gunting stuff works really good when someone's in a really sort of mild mannered behaviour because there's no adrenaline pumping. Yeah, but you get I some got creams. Well, I did that with the death touch guys, you know, the dim mac dudes. I actually got asked to leave a seminar because um, uh, these guys are doing these death touches, and I said, I said, look, I'm a security guy, and and this is like the early '90s and when it was becoming very trendy at the time, and I said. So I'm a security guy. So if I grabbed you, if someone grabbed me aggressively, I could like press here, press there and knock them out. And they go, yeah. And they're knocking these people out. And I thought, this is great. I want to see this, you know. And uh, so, I'm, so I did the same thing I did with the knife. I, I went up and said, okay, so you're trying to tell me what, mate? I said, mate, I think you're full of shit. So I've just started this verbal scenario without telling anyone. The whole seminar went dead quiet. And I've just grabbed this guy, slammed him into the wall. And he's going, dit, 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 like a fucking typewriter on me trying to tap me on the side of the shoulders and hit me in there. Nothing happened. So I headbutted him slightly, and I said, mate, what happened? And he goes, oh, see, what happens when you're aggressive? 
um, your, your nerves rise to the surface. Uh, and, and that way, it may, I said, my nerves do what? They rise to the surface. <laughs> so, so there are a lot of charlatans out there, mate. A lot of wow. charlatans. And, and, and I can see that stuff being great when you're doing control and restraint and trying to move like um, uh, protesters or something. But I think mm. against someone being very aggressive and they're trying to take your head off, if you think that you're going to be able to do that on him, I think you're, you're, you're kidding yourself. You know? so, no. Well, there's, there's a deluded aspect to the martial arts community and you yeah. see an FMA, you know, I hate yeah. to say, and whether they didn't check out for themselves, they just took for granted what was given to them. They didn't do their due diligence or they know what's over there, but they put the blinders on. You know yeah. what I mean? I don't you know, know what too, if you look at old videos, old tape of Filipino martial arts going back to the fifties, there's a French video out there where they took Filipino martial arts in the fifties. Yes, I saw that. Trying yeah. to swipe, yeah. And if you look at some of the others, look at some of the old pictures, you'll see the sticks are slightly longer and you'll see it's fencing with a stick. Yeah. They're swinging that stick all the time. You don't see a lot of these pass by parries and all this type of stuff. And I've seen a lot of that sort of come into the, into the art, even from the early eighties, I've seen it come in there closer and closer. You know, a lot of this tap, tap, tap with a stick and other Nikos and all this type of stuff. Yeah. And, and, and they sort of, I don't know, I think it's sort of lost the essence a little bit of what it should be about. It's Eskrima is fencing, you know, defense with the stick. I mean, to use the stick. Um, and I think, yeah, I see a lot of that stuff I think is, um, oh, look, I suppose in peacetime, you end up with a shitload of instructors. In wartime, you have very, very few. Well, you end up uh, with a bunch of instructors, systems become bigger, more techniques, more memorization, yeah. Yeah. more ranks, more, in you know what I mean? So and it really, when, if you really want to come there to common denominator, the money. You know? Yeah. And it's all about technique. It fascinates the hell out of me. Like when I see people do Sinawali, I see them stand there and they swing the stick and they're looking at the sticks and they're hitting stick against stick. Mm -hmm. I tell guys, if you're going to do Sinawali, aim at the guy's head and yeah. use the head as the target, not the stick. But that's getting lost because they're so, in, the, in other words, if you're getting your information in a seminar format, you're, I can tell you right now, you're not being corrected. You're going to be yep. hitting stick against. I mean, when you know, that's it. so that's what a lot of. The, yeah, you know, when you hit when you hit stick against stick, what happens? Unfortunately, you end up hitting the middle of the stick. Yeah, so you find when guys spar with that Filipino headgear, they yeah. actually hit the guy in the head with the middle of the stick all the time. Now, no. I'll tell you now, if I got the middle of the one of those sticks and I walked up to you now with no headgear and I hit you on the side of the head, it would hurt you, but it wouldn't damage you that bad. But yeah. if I took a slight step back and hit you with the last three inches of that stick, yeah. I'd rip your head open. I mean, that's the difference. That's the so, way the way you know, coming through, pulling the tip through. Yeah, no, yeah. I know. I, how I how, how you train is how you react. And yeah. what I'm trying to explain is not ever go at the guys, but make them understand that when it comes to true combat, that's really what you're looking at. That's what you need to be aware of. All these positional changes, that spatial awareness, where you stand, mm -hmm. how far away you are, what you do. You know, I do with you know, you should always be practicing that stuff over and over and over again. Understanding where your personal space is, how you yeah. feel, you know, how close do you to get to someone before they can feel it? Oh yeah. Well, you know, before you like, hey, yeah, or you yeah, yeah, that's all wow, wow, great stuff. I yeah. get my guys to do personal space training at the beginning of every class. I get them to walk up to each individual and try to read where their personal space is by watching them make an action. I tell them, don't move. Don't look, don't do anything, just stand there still. And you still can pick up these little minute of comfortability. Yeah, 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 and you go, yeah. there you go, that's your personal space. Yeah, I give them yeah. to that beginning of every class so they understand where that personal and then on that's certain good. days, Dean, your your personal space might be uh three feet away, and then some days it's two feet. Yeah. And some days you don't care. And other days it's ten feet. Uh -huh. I mean, it just depends on your emotion. And that's another thing that people don't take into account. Good days and bad days. Right, right. Wow. I think we're going to get anyway, you back on. I don't know. We have to... I, think you, I, think you need to, I think you need to terminate me now. I think we're going on too long now. No, 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 no. We need to get you back on. And we could talk about, I mean, there's, I could find plenty to talk about. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, but I well, appreciate I think... you. Thank you very much for having me on. I, I really no, my it. gosh. Thank you for coming on. We got to thank Mark. I got to thank Mark. 
I mean, um, you know, so got to thank him, I, man. He's, he, I love that guy. He's, he's, yeah, a great yeah, guy. he's, he's a trip, but, uh, Hey, well, you take care. I hope things in Australia continue to go or get better, whatever status quo is, I guess. <laughs> Mate, it's a wonderful country full of wonderful people. We can only get better, we hope. We're, yeah. we're going through a lot of hard times, just like everyone else in the world. And, um, you know, it's all about trying to uh, understand each other and, uh, and move forward and not lose that uh, application of yourself. I mean, yeah. that's the thing that I that frightens me the most about this modern world, is that we're becoming very much like carbon copies of people and not being ourselves uh, anymore. Scary, you know, and it's very scary stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, Maestro Dean, you take care. Well, you too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Keep you. Good. All right. <laughs> Keep strong. See you, mate. Bye bye. Bye. Wow. That was most enjoyable, and I just love talking to guys about stuff like that, not just emptying against night, but just tactics and methodology and just uh, stretch inoculation and stuff like that. So who is next? Uh, Guru Tom, tomorrow night. Uh, Mario, the Cyan, uh, Screamer, uh, tennis ball guys. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so Mario, who's... Uh, who, Maestro Maro, who is in the Philippines. And then possibly Sunday night, I might be back on. So, but if you're around, I think um, 7 p.m. Eastern time, I think he's going on tomorrow night. And again, that's going to be with uh, Maestro Mario, Carpenter Versailles, and uh, Screamer, or Corto. I know I'm missing something. Uh, long day. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.